and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monika Skonieczny, and I am the manager of the Trotsje Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design, also known as TISED. I would like to welcome everyone to the third TISED talk of this academic year titled Transcending Disciplinary Boundaries and Policy Stovepipes Through Design, the Case of Post-Urban Densification for Resilience. Before we begin, on behalf of TISED, I would like to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which the people of the world now gather. And while we are very hopeful that in the coming months, we will indeed be able to gather and meet in three dimensions, for the time being, we continue to meet virtually as the pandemic is still part of our everyday lives. A quick housekeeping note before we introduce our speaker. After the presentation, we will have some time to answer questions from the viewers. So please feel free to either enter them into the chat throughout the talk, or if you prefer, you can wait until the end and we will give you an opportunity to unmute your mic, raise your hand and ask your question directly if you like. Keep in mind that this presentation is being recorded. With that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. We are pleased to welcome Professor Nick Luca, who is an associate professor cross-appointed to the Peter Guauhau Fu School of Architecture, as well as the School of Urban Planning at McGill. Professor Luca is also an associate director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Montreal at McGill University and a full member of TISED. Professor Luca's main research interest is in urban design as an interdisciplinary approach to better understanding the form, processes, uses, and meanings of space in everyday settings, and how this can enable us to develop sustainable yet strategic design and policy interventions. Professor Luca, the floor is yours. That's great. Thank you, Monica, and uh, thank you, Tyset, for inviting me, and thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm going to start uh, the inevitable uh, slide deck. So I am here, da, da, and hopefully you can see slides and only slides, uh, no speakers notes or any of that treasure. So maybe I could get a hurrah from, from someone. You're good. Thank you so much, hurrah. All right, so my title is a mouthful um, and uh, I'm, uh, that's, that's, um, Deliberate, but it's because I wanted to weave a whole bunch of uh, matters of concern uh, and preoccupations and and uh, key points right into the uh, banner for this talk. And uh, it's a talk that's based on work that I've been focusing on uh, in the last three or four years, uh, and especially thanks to some very uh, well financed collaborations with colleagues uh, in Sweden, the EU and across Canada. Uh, but I'm not going to do that sort of here's my CV introduction to my talk, because uh, you can all look at my website if you're if you're that intrigued. Um, what I want to talk about is actually something I've been doing for the 25 years or so. I've been doing scholarly and professional work uh, in architecture planning and related fields. And uh, my, uh, my training is in both of those professions, but I did a PhD in cultural geography because I'm very interested in the processes by which uh, we do cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural work and the way that we need to do that uh, to meet the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century, such as climate change and the ongoing questions of social justice. So I'm going to um, uh, talk about uh, some uh, questions that have arisen and the ways in which there are current debates uh, that are they're raging, but they're also starting to converge in very important ways. And I think there are ways that are of particular interest uh, that uh, to the TIZED membership and to the larger communities of practice um, in which TIZED uh, is situated. Uh, and that includes engineers, architects, planners, uh, but also uh, public administrators, uh, law specialists, um, everyday citizens who are interested in uh, the future, uh, especially in terms of uh, the survival of, of uh, humankind uh, in the face of climate change, uh, but also uh, the, the sort of more uh, uh, practical and immediate uh, matters of how we can reform our professional and uh, governance processes. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask you to bear with me on some of the things and to and to take a, a few, uh, uh, take me at my word on a couple of, of uh, premises that I'm going to put forward. Uh, but what I really want to talk about uh, in, in, in this talk is uh, ways in which the 
wicked problems, which is a, a term that's used a lot in, in public administration, and opportunities of post-suburban densification are really interesting for working through transdisciplinary work in policy and design. So a short version of my title might be that's transdisciplinary policy through design. How can we get across disciplinary silos, stovepipes, and solitudes, as they've often been referred to, in order to uh, work through exciting challenges and opportunities? And uh, I'll just give a, a brief uh, explanation of what I mean by post-suburban, because there's all this jargon in the title, what on earth is he talking about? Post-suburban is a term that has come to be used to describe parts of our metropolitan regions, whether they're so cities and, and, uh, and larger urban areas, such as Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, the largest three or the most populous three in Canada, uh, but also smaller uh, metropolitan centers. But those parts of those uh, metropolitan areas that uh, were suburban uh, at a certain point in their time, and especially those that were built out in the post-war uh, boom years of the Tante Glorieuse, where the vast majority of the housing stock we have in Canada was actually produced. Uh, so post-suburban is a term which refers to when places that were suburban move beyond being suburban, the new uh, sort of subdivisions or productions on the rural urban fringe, so to speak. And there's a tendency for them to be forgotten or neglected. Uh, and this is something I've been working on uh, for about 20 years uh, or more, uh, because there's a lot of attention in architecture and planning and related fields to urban neighborhoods, city neighborhoods, uh, so the plateaus and the NDGs and the Westmounts and uh, the Lachines, um, depending on how you want to define Lachine as a city neighborhood or not. But there's less attention that we played, pay to, uh, scholarly attention we pay to places like DDO uh, or Surrey uh, or uh, Kanata, uh, Etobicoke, Markham, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the premises that, that uh, matters of concern and matters of fact really are important in these post-suburban landscapes, which by some measures house up to 80% of Canada's uh, metropolitan population. So uh, that's where we've got a lot of stuff going on. And if we want to affect change in terms of sustainability and social justice, it's probably in the spaces where most people uh, are, are based. And of course, since the pandemic uh, hit uh, and was recognized in 2020 as such, um, we're spending a lot more time in many cases in our domestic uh, realms uh, as, as we are all doing, or many of us are doing today, um, working from home. So the core argument that I make, um, I'm making in this talk and that I uh, explore in my, in, my, uh, in my work is uh, that if we are uh, facing densification because the state and its various forms and agencies from the federal down to the uh, hyper-local sort of arrondissement level, um, but also social need, if they entail densification, if densification is something that is seen as both desirable and inevitable, then we can't just allow it to happen using business as usual models that we developed in the 20th century. We need different kinds of savoir-faire. Uh, and I argue that that's a savoir-faire of design. It's a, it's a special kind of knowledge uh, that exists in design thinking and is uh, demonstrated by, I think what the spirit of Tai Zed represents is, is very much this kind of savoir faire, but is often found in uh, the transdisciplinary work uh, that links architects, landscape architects, uh, planners, uh, civil engineers, and other specialists of design. Uh, we can't just work through the, the, the models and the tools that, and, the, and the methods that we used uh, in the 20th century to produce and maintain urban and suburban space if we're going to make densification work on the ground. And I'm going to walk through that argument um, in, the, uh, in the next slides. In the invitation, um, there was a provocation and uh, uh, a link to a piece that I published uh, earlier, uh, well, it was about a year ago now. Uh, and and it, it's the final, it's the punchline of my abstract or my, uh, or my short teaser for this talk, um, which is that if densification is happening, the question we have to ask is uh, not how dense we make it, but how we make it dense. And uh, that is to say that quantitative uh, and, and sort of more factual indices or measures or descriptions uh, of density are not as relevant in the work of densification as are ways in which density is experienced and perceived by users. And here's where there's one premise 
uh, that I want to just lay on the table and hopefully uh, we are happy, of course, to discuss it. Um, but a lot of empirical work has been done in the field of environment behavior studies, environmental psychology, in studies of housing satisfaction and choice, especially in places that are dense. You see some images here. These are uh, examples of the cases um, I've been examining with my research teams in both Canada and Sweden. Um, and it's found that people who live and work in dense contexts, uh, their satisfaction, their contentment, their stress levels, their, their concerns about changes in density, and the changes in density, of course, are usually in the, of the upward uh, variety, um, those concerns do not increase or, or even relate in clear ways to the quantitative measure of the number of units or the number of jobs or the number of, uh, of people that are located per square kilometer or per 100 uh, uh, square meters. Uh, or per hectare, as the case may be. It's perceived density that matters. It's the perception of density. It's the, it's the sort of the nuisance that can be associated with noise, uh, with smells, um, with not being able to concentrate. Um, if you're doing work, not being able to sleep, um, if, you've got, uh, if you're a light sleeper, and so on and so forth. And these are matters of perception. So um, the title of this piece on the subtitle on porosity as a co-requisite of densification, this is, this is an idea that has been uh, in circulation in architecture debates for uh, at least uh, 20 years or so. And the idea of porosity is that densification has to have a lightness to it. And, and the argument really is derived from a piece that was written uh, by Walter Benjamin with uh, the philosopher, with a, with a collaborator, uh, Lachis, Aya Lachis, uh, on Naples uh, in the uh, 1920s. Uh, and they argued that uh, what makes Naples work as a city is that it has a kind of porosity, just like the pumice stone that we find in volcanic landscapes. Uh, and pumice, if you've ever used pumice in your bathtub, for instance, is an incredibly lightweight stone because it has got a lot of air pockets uh, in it. And so the idea that they extended in this metaphor was that porosity is something that makes density quite exciting and quite bearable, quite bearable because uh, density in many ways is a good and exciting thing. Um, we've become a little bit more wary of it since the pandemic and with the norms around physical distancing, which of course are norms of physical distancing, not social distancing. Uh, but by and large, if you think about the cocktail parties, the proverbial cocktail parties that we would go to um, before uh, COVID uh, came to dominate our lives, uh, we like events like that when there's a bit of crowdedness, when you have to sort of bump into people as you're moving through the room and you strike up a conversation. Uh, the contrary example I like to give of that is the uh, stereotypical junior high school, middle school dance, where uh, uh, everyone is pressed up against the wall in the gym or in the, in the cafeteria, and everyone is afraid to approach other people to dance, and there's not enough density uh, to, to make the event uh, interesting and exciting. So as a first premise, there's this idea that density is not something that can readily be measured uh, in absolute terms. In in ways that are useful for the work that we need to do. Uh, okay. Another thing that's really important to know about um, density, and this is the challenge of densification, is that it's really easy to do densification badly, to increase the number of jobs uh, and people and or people on a, on a particular area of land in a way that is not particularly well liked by people. And in showing this image, this is just on the South Shore here in Montreal, I'm not trying to um, uh, tar and feather this particular site and context. But this is, of course, what many people uh, dislike about uh, densification. They're, they're fearful that uh, buildings and, and uh, open space will be combined in ways that are not as charming, not as agreeable, not, uh, very, not so much at the human scale, uh, uh, to quote uh, an idea that has uh, been trafficked quite a bit in the last uh, 20 years, uh, and uh, we'll, that we end up with uh, sort of somewhat depressing spaces with large pieces of public art. Those are, those are sculptures of pigeons. They're not giant mutant pigeons, if you're looking closely at the photograph there. Okay, so there is definite concern about densification because it's easy to do badly, especially if we just extrude built forms um, from a plan. And this is what I mean by design savoir-faire, that, that the work of architects is especially important because we can manipulate the perception of density by playing with volumes and so on and so forth. Now, here's why it's, it's especially urgent. This is actually a, a government released proposition for densification on how you can help people to get excited about meeting new density targets that have been laid out in policy. And this is in Ontario, uh, in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, 
which is now defined and has been uh, in, in good ways and for right, the correct reasons, I, I say, uh, as, a, as a, a, an area of densification with a green belt, a protected agricultural and natural biodiversity belt uh, in which uh, large scale urbanization is not possible. But I'll just show you these images again. This is a before and after of a main street in a smaller town uh, in, in, the, uh, in the metropolitan area. Uh, this is a before image. And then we have this after image. And, and not many people would say, this is marvelous, fantastic. It's exactly the kind of architecture we want for our cities. And uh, if you've been participating in any of the recent sort of conversations and panels and debates in Montreal, for instance, we're having fierce conversations about more tall buildings in the central area. And of course, this is a lot of what dominates densification debates. It's this kind of large scale, high volume densification. I'm not, I, I say that this is, this is problematic. This is clumsy densification. And it's what's being called by some scholars, hard densification. And what we actually need to do, especially in areas where people live in neighborhoods is practice softer, gentler, and more malleable forms of densification. And the reason why is embodied in these two individuals. Um, these, uh, some of you may remember this a few years ago, they became infamous across Canada. They're in a Toronto neighborhood. They organized a neighborhood group that was opposed to uh, densification. Uh, and these, uh, many of these sorts of um, reactionary groups uh, adopt the, you know, the acronym SOS, um, right? There's always an urgency. It's, it's danger. Um, the ship is sinking. Come quickly. We're, we're all going to die um, and present the problem as one of, of tremendous urgency and, and gravity. Um, this uh, particular neighborhood group um, came to be a little bit infamous because it turned out that they were worried about their one to two million dollar properties having to share the neighborhood with new townhouses that were being built which were only going to be worth about eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars and so they were worried proverbially proverbially and and quite plainly in their statements about poor people moving in now, i don't know about you but uh even with my good professor's salary and a household with you know considerable assets um eight to nine hundred thousand dollars uh, to purchase a dwelling is not what i would call um, cheap, cheap, or easy, or even affordable. And of course, we're in the midst of an affordability crisis in uh, our Canadian metropolitan areas. So I'm, I'm using that example as uh, why uh, densification is a matter that we need to pay attention to, because anyone who's been at a public meeting as an engineer, architect, and planner will probably have experienced something like this. An individual who yells up, who stands up and yells, and yells up in many ways, um, is furious, is angry, is afraid right, is, is feeling uh, as though there's a serious threat to that, to, to that person's self-identity uh, and, uh, and, and collective, individual and collective well-being. And it's a, it's a phenomenon that's called in, in planning circles, uh, nimbyism, not in my backyardism. People saying, well, of course we need to provide more housing and we need to make housing more affordable, but I don't want it to be near me. I don't want it to be in my little neighborhood. And people will, uh, will fight and mobilize uh, considerable resources. And this is one of the things that we've been challenged with in the work of increasing densities to make better use of uh, land, hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, such as social services, uh, et cetera. And a lot of the oppositions are framed in terms of loss of character uh, and change in the ambiance and the, and, the, and the things that people like about their surroundings. Um, so as much as I you know, am a professor in architecture and urban planning, and I have training in those fields, I also consider myself an ethnographer. And most of my work has been in the work of ethnography, cultural ethnography, understanding how people create meaning in their everyday environments and uh, in their uh, everyday behavior, uh, et cetera. And this photograph um, is from a study in Australia. And this is a quote from this charming old couple. Um, I find it kind of paradoxical. One of the reasons they're afraid of uh, increased density is that it will destroy the rural ambience of our neighborhood. And the photographer and the research team very cleverly posed them in front of a building which is clearly not what we would in most Anglo-American contexts associate with uh, a rural uh, milieu, a rural setting. Uh, it's a concrete slab building with a, about eight stories. It's got an elevator. It's probably got a parking garage underneath it. Uh, typically, uh, rural land values do not uh, uh, engender that kind of high, uh, higher cost uh, uh, and high point density construction. So all this is to say that densification is what we would call a matter of concern in the social sciences, right? And I'm, I'm drawing here on Bruno Latour, um, who argued uh, and has argued in many of his works uh, that we need to uh, combine work that we do on matters of fact, 
um, which we can clearly and easily uh, 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 document and discuss uh, empirically uh, with matters of concern. That is to say, questions that are hard to address, uh, that don't have uh, self-evident responses or, or solutions, um, as, as the case may be. And it's an argument that I've developed with a couple of the colleagues with whom I've been working for about 10 years um, in, uh, in Sweden and in, in, in the European Union um, in a piece uh, published in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. So a bit of shameless self-promotion, but also a bit of here I have some credibility on this point. Let me walk you through why I think that densification is a matter of concern. And there are a number of key things. These are images uh, from uh, the, the 20th century. The image on the left is actually of a model of uh, a, a, a block on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, and it's from the Tenement House Exhibition of 1900. New York was a place where tremendous densification occurred, driven largely by immigration and, and, uh, and uh, economic um, activity, uh, production, but also speculation on land. And tremendous problems were seen. What we've witnessed and what we've talked about a lot since the pandemic became a major matter of fact and concern is, of course, that proximity can be highly problematic for vector in terms of vector-borne diseases, right? The proximity of people uh, and the lack of air and circulation it's also a matter of, of, of tremendous uh, importance when we think about fire and uh, the fact that uh, fire and other sorts of um, calamities could uh, readily strike. So, so much of planning as a profession, which really arose and was formalized in the early 20th century in countries like Canada, uh, the US, Sweden, uh, other parts of the OECD, is actually very much predicated on undensification. Um, zoning bylaws, uh, regulations, um, and, and policies have really sort of um, conspired quite deliberately and quite successfully to undensify. And what I'm showing here is what I would call poor track records on densification. There's a reason that we have a lot of policy frameworks and, and, and institutional norms that discourage higher densities because we haven't done such good work in many cases. That image on the right is actually of a, of a typical pop-up that was built um, across uh, central Montreal in the 1960s and the 1970s. Many uh, of our students at McGill and the other universities in Montreal um, spend significant chunks of their lives in these small uh, uh, studio apartments uh, in these sort of pop-up houses. And, and the image in the middle is of a, a, a hyper-densified uh, lagoon uh, retirement uh, neighborhood uh, in, uh, in Las Vegas. These are not really uh, products of, 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 um, of architecture and planning that we should be tremendously satisfied with. And indeed, uh, public opinion has tended to say, hmm, we're not so enthused about this, uh, and that translates into political action, and so on and so forth. There's a second really important dimension to this uh, undensification um, pattern that, uh, that has become normalized over uh, the last 150 years in, in Anglo-American countries. And it's encapsulated in this uh, excerpt from a, a very uh, well-selling, a, a best-selling book from 1884 by Thomas Hill, which talked about right and wrong, how we should lead a good life. And on the left-hand side, what we see is a denser, more mixed urban neighborhood. And on the right-hand side, we see a new sort of garden suburb with detached houses. And, and the uh, uh, you know, black and white distinction is being drawn here. Um, on the left-hand side, we see poverty, squalor, intemperance, and crime. And on the right-hand side, we see pleasant, beautiful, happy homes. So all of this is to say um, that there are a lot of ideologies and cultural norms that have been baked into professional practices uh, that have been normalized. And we grapple with this. The images are really lovely. If you look closely at them, of course, in the, in the foreground, we've got a couple of, of men. Looks like one is wearing a phantom of the opera mask, having a brawl. Uh, there is in the middle of the image on the left-hand side, a father or a man who appears to be drunk leaning against the lamppost and the, there's a little girl presumably his daughter saying daddy daddy please come home no i'm too drunk i'm too drunk i'm just gonna lean on this post so there's a strong moral argument that bad people and bad behavior are associated with higher densities and um i didn't include it in this slide but uh, this carried well through the 20th century and uh, some work that was done um, by the team i worked with at quebec city at university laval managed to dredge up flyers and other kinds of propaganda, quite literally propaganda, produced by the Catholic Church in Quebec, um, which was uh, aimed at, for instance, newlyweds. And on the left-hand side, they showed a neighborhood like the Plateau with plexes, you know, outdoor staircases. On the right-hand side, they showed a picture of well-spread-out detached houses, bungalows, and in the middle was the married couple, and the pamphlet would say things like, you're a newlywed couple. Which path will you choose? Will you choose the dirty, horrible Plex neighborhood where you will find immorality and 
and, and badness, or will you choose the healthy, airy, uh, suburban neighborhood on the right hand side? So we've, you know, we've been conditioned culturally um, uh, to, to, uh, to be wary of densification. And that's layered on top of what we know are, you know, empirical, factual sorts of reasons for um, not having too great concentrations of people, jobs, and activities, et cetera. There's a third reason that densification is really important in terms of what we're, uh, what I'm talking about here today. And um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this uh, cartoon, but it's a London Board of Health uh, Committee uh, parodied uh, in their, their quest for where cholera was taking place. And this is a little tip of the hat to uh, the engineers in the room. Um, this is around public trust in the state, but it's uh, a cartoon that was reproduced by Stephen Halliday in uh, The Great Stink of London, which is a great study of engineering history and how uh, public outrage is what led to engineering innovation. Uh, and, and the cartoon that I'm showing here, if I just back up the animations a wee bit, um, the cartoon is that all of these experts, all of these government specialists, all of these professionals are claiming that they're trying to figure out how to make things better but they're, they're clueless, right? There's a, there's a crisis of public trust. And this has been empirically documented um, in countries like Canada. There's concern around public trust uh, that uh, there's concern that, uh, that people have, Monsieur and Madame Toulemont have in uh, the state uh, and, in, and in professionals. And we've seen many frightening examples of that with COVID in terms of uh, anti-vaxxers, um, but also in terms of uh, what has been happening over the last week with uh, truckers. Um, and that's not to say we should accept what the state um, uh, prescribes or aims to do um, without critique uh, and uh, without holding their feet to the fire, but that uh, in general there are concerns that people have and there's fear that if we allow densification to happen, then uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope and then who knows what else uh, will follow and uh, our quality of life individually and collectively um, will drop considerably. So I thought I would just do the stereotypical Cartoon, 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 cartoon slide. Um, this is from Dilbert in the olden days. Some of you uh, who've got gray in uh, your, your hair like me um, will remember Dilbert. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that I have fallen into the classic trap of including in my presentation, a cartoon. Uh, and it's given by a guy who's giving a boring presentation but the cartoon has no punchline. Anyway, that's just to see if you're uh, still awake. Um, but also to do a little bit of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, humbling of myself. Um, I, I don't pr pr profess to have uh, answers to the questions I've raised in my abstract and uh, the provocations for this talk. But I do think we know about what we have to be careful of um, in terms of densification and public concern. This is an image, uh, an early study of City Concordia uh, and densification in the Milton Park area. Uh, and uh, if you look closely on the left-hand side, there's a magnificent sort of fountain, and it might even be a couple of little um, sort of boats in the fountain on the Pine Park intersection. Um, and those of you who've been to Montreal for maybe about 20 years uh, or more will remember that we took apart the Pine Park intersection uh, and rebuilt it as, a, as an at-grade intersection after it was uh, organized as a kind of a miniature expressway interchange. Uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s. And the site that we're looking at here is actually where Place de la Cité is, so Prince Arthur and uh, Park Avenue, um, where the four towers um, are, uh, are found on uh, one on each corner. And this was an important moment where densification was challenged and top-down expert-led city building was challenged in Montreal. It was the Montreal moment uh, where public mobilization uh, en ensured that uh, the Milton Park neighborhood was not destroyed through the blockbusting techniques that were being uh, employed at the time when the Cité Concordia project was underway, but that we also thought about different ways to house people uh, uh, in ways that are socially and uh, financially and, and uh, one, would, one could argue ecologically uh, sustainable. So this is a big part of the public trust and the state question that we need to be aware of in terms of achieving densification. Uh, we've promoted these ideas and technically we can do a lot of the densification. The, the, the transformation of Place, Place Alexis Nyon at Atwater and Sherbrooke is a real, or St. Catherine Street rather, um, is a really good example of densification over a long period of time. The tower that exists there was actually added uh, after the original project was, was uh, built. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have a popular science monthly from a hundred years ago. Um, we've always been fascinated by technological strategies for increasing activity, making better use of infrastructure, and so on and so forth. 
And I use these images here to remind us that it's not a matter of technology or, or uh, uh, the procedural know-how of making density, increasing density. It's very much a cultural and political question of, of what is often called social acceptability um, in urban studies and related fields. Um, again, I wanna remind you that we have problems with densification and there are public, uh, there's public opposition to initiatives um, to increase densities because we successfully uh, created some problematic settings or we, uh, we destroyed high, highly valued and highly prized neighborhoods and landscapes uh, in densification projects in the 60s and 70s, such as here in Toronto. This is the High Park area. And uh, this is an image from Gothic Avenue in the foreground, which has got the pin shown in the foreground, which was literally ground zero for where a new uh, um, a municipal administration was voted in in the early 1970s that completely transformed the way that uh, Toronto was being uh, rebuilt um, through uh, as of right and, uh, and regulatory reforms that encouraged the sort of densification that we see here. So we have this kind of, there's this, this hangover, we could call it, of some stuff that was not done so uh, uh, well, or in at least not in ways that people found um, uh, delightful and charming and so on and so forth. Why am I saying all of these things? One of the reasons that I'm doing work in Sweden um, is because this cartoon here is literally what is being done in Sweden right now, where there's a new town, a de facto new town project underway. Uh, five major new areas are being built with tens of thousands of new dwellings, as was historically done in the, in the post-war, the mid 20th century years in Sweden. And what's being done is that tracts of forest and parkland that were quite deliberately built into these suburban neighborhoods in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, with the recognition that people like to have places that are not hard and urban heat island spaces. Swedes like to go through the forest and collect berries and mushrooms. So having a little patch of forest near your dwelling is important. Uh, and what the state is now doing in Sweden is literally saying, we need to get rid of all of these silly green spaces that are useless, tear them down. We're going to build buildings and buildings and buildings. We're going to densify because densification is the magic bullet for achieving sustainability. If we're going to reduce carbon budgets, if we're going to uh, allow people to walk and ride bikes, and, uh, and so on and so forth, if we're going to reduce sprawl. And there's good empirical evidence for how people who are in denser neighborhoods, more jobs, more housing, tend to use their car less uh, than, uh, than others. This is really a question, however, of institutional capacity. How can we achieve densification in ways that are not uh, going to alienate populations, cause uh, frustration, insurrections, and so on and so forth. And so the, the punchline maybe for the talk in a sense is, um, I'm borrowing here from a piece in Administration and Society by Head and Alford, um, state apparatus is really good in liberal democracies and totalitarian regimes. The institutional capacity uh, is fine when we're doing standardized, normalized, routine, high volume things. But they're not, state apparatus and state uh, civil servants are not as good, not through any fault of their own, at doing things that are non-routine and non-standard service challenges. And densification with porosity, densification that isn't uh, uh, heavy handed and so on and so forth is in this latter category. It is work that is often bespoke. It involves a lot more uh, close site-by-site -site scrutiny on what is appropriate, what will work, what the trade-offs and entailments will be of a densification regime. And uh, for those of you um, familiar with public admin debate, you probably recognize again here the idea of the wicked problem, problems that are very hard to tackle because the problem is hard to define and the response or the solution, so to speak, is not self-evident. Um, those of you unfamiliar with public admin, I just wanted to signal that this is this is the kind of thing where, and I think TIZED is a really important institute in this respect or, or space in this respect, that we need to grapple with the conjugation of of, of a procedural and technological know-how in, in uh, engineering and design, but also with questions of culture, politics, and uh, institutional pathways, and so on and so forth. And the reason I refer to stovepipes in the title is that public sector agencies that create plans, policies, strategies, and so on and so forth, tend to work in stovepipes. They tend to work in, uh, in long, uh, impermeable uh, pathways uh, and there are rare instances where there can be cross-sectoral um, and cross-disciplinary collaboration. And this is the same sort of problem that we deal with when architects have to sit down with engineers, 
to work on some kind of a project brief and realize in many ways they're speaking different languages and are working from different sets of assumptions. Uh, so this is the familiar refrain around transdisciplinary work, collaboration, and so on and so forth. It's much easier to say that we should do it than uh, to actually do it. So to sort of wrap up my, my comments here, I just want to uh, give you a couple of examples of how densification is something that is happening and is a, is a matter of, of, um, of fact, as well as a matter of concern. It's been a scholarly and professional preoccupation for decades. The book on the left was published in the 1980s. I went to architecture school using this as a reference, uh, the Peter Calthorpe book on how can we transform the way in which we produce uh, space. Uh, so that we make better use out of scarce resources. And the basic argument is we need to densify and we need to diversify. The book in the middle is a little bit more uh, damning in its indictment. It says we need to retrofit uh, suburban landscapes. Uh, we need to address 70 years of failed urban form. Emily Talon is someone who's argued that basically the vast majority of the built environment that we produced in, in, in North America is failed urban form. It does not pass muster. Now, I'm not so extreme because of course you can't say that this is failed urban form when we have high levels of human um, uh, development uh, and satisfaction, not necessarily so good, we're not so good on, on uh, social justice and the equity of access to neighborhoods and, 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 uh, and contexts that provide for a happy and, and, and uh, prosperous life. Um, but we can say that suburban and post-suburban neighborhoods are places where many people are quite content, are quite satisfied. And so proposing to densify and transform these neighborhoods and these landscapes is, of course, what leads to nimbyism. So I think, again, take me at my words, but feel free to Google. Um, there are lots and lots of good current uh, studies that are being done on densification, uh, and they usually talk about challenges and strategies. It's not just a matter of let's increase density. Um, we can do that in a second year architecture studio at the undergraduate level and come up with interesting responses. It's how can we make it work politically, culturally, and uh, given the uh, inertia of the built environment. And needless to say, it's something that we are being told we need to do collect through collective agreement. Okay, liberal uh, democracies from on both sides of, of the Atlantic have said we need to densify. Densification is something that will be good if it's done well. Um, these are just two Canadian examples. Our, our two most populous uh, census metropolitan areas, Toronto Hamilton on the left and Montreal on the right. And what these, these uh, maps, which are official parts of legal documents for uh, charting the future of our, of, our, of our metropolitan areas, what these maps tell us is that we have identified a whole bunch of nodes or points or centers that will be focal points for growth and densification. And they often are drawn with these little circles. Um, this is often called transit-oriented development. The circles represent a train uh, or uh, metro stations that exist or that are going to be built and what they are often uh, 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 presented with in terms of uh, uh, regulatory frameworks uh, is uh, minimum density thresholds. So not maximum density thresholds, which is what we'd spent most of the 20th century doing, but actual minimum numbers of jobs and residents per uh, net uh, square kilometer, uh, for instance. And this kind of visual material is used in most contexts, right? This is Southern Sweden, where we've also done a number of detailed studies. And what's interesting is that each one of these little circles has been represented in some of these studies as saying, look at all of the empty space, we can densify so easily. And that's what those little pie charts on the left-hand slide represent, okay? They don't have anything to do with time, they actually have to do with how much land uh, is, um, uh, is, is built up within a kilometer from the train platform um, in this uh, map of train stations in uh, Skåne, Skania, uh, the southern part of Sweden. And so these little circles are represented, are these are higher resolution versions of them in which they're saying, look at all that empty space that can be densified. But what happens when we try to densify, when we go from matters of fact to matters of concern, of course, is that we have our friends come out of the woodwork, the people who say densification is not just a matter of increasing the number of jobs. Etc. Now, this is a little thing I was going to talk to you about in terms of gross net, stents, net density, but I'm going to skip over that. Um, density is something that has happened in human settlements for as long as we've had human settlements. They increase in density because people say, let's make better use out of this land because we want to. And the regulatory frameworks that we've created in, in countries like Canada have tended to thwart that densification. So the work that needs to be done if we're going to grapple with this preoccupation of the state to densify is actually both to reform regulations but to reform institutional and cultural practices. 
And um, the Capte de Spectacle is a well-known example of where public space was being heavily remade in good ways for the most part, but also in ways that deserve critique and, and, uh, and, and cheerful skepticism. Um, but um, where there was also a lot of uh, densification that accompanied that. The red volumes in this diagram are uh, new uh, building volumes that have been uh, um, enabled and produced um, since the project was begun about 17, 18 years ago. Okay, and uh, here's some reading if you want to go further on this um, uh, that, uh, as an interesting example. I end with the post-suburban space because that's where the, the rubber hits the road. Um, if we go to the South Shore, what we see here is that old shopping malls like Place Langueil are the focal points for densification regimes. And the challenges that we face if we're not going to end up with this kind of space or this kind of stuff and that kind of reaction, and even if it's in peri-urban spaces, et cetera, et cetera, is to figure out ways we can do softer densification. And that engenders and requires um, transdisciplinary collaborations where, and I'm laying all my cards on the table here, I think architects have a heightened role to play. Um, architects have really been in many ways removed from the production of everyday space in countries like Canada, because there's a focus, there's tendency for architects to focus on showcase projects like concert halls and so on and so forth. And in Canada, architects are not involved in the production of housing by and large, but the affordability crisis has sort of brought this back onto the radar. And I find that my students increasingly in architecture as well as planning are saying, we want to work on housing. We want to figure out how to deal with housing questions. And so the punchline of all this, if you think back to the Dilbert uh, cartoon, is that we can do really exciting work in the, in the idiom of uh, what is called soft densification or gentle densification. And this is just an example of uh, how this has been uh, codified and normalized um, in, a, in a part of France um, in, uh, in the Loire Department. It's uh, an idea around softer densification that allows for uh, a, a, an increase of, uh, that is significant in terms of numbers uh, to occur, but without compromising the visual and experiential character of the places. And I always like to uh, include in, in discussions like this, um, uh, as a punctuation of why it's not a matter of how dense you make it, but how you make it dense. This is the very same quantitative density expressed in three very different forms. And the form that's on the right is the one that tends to be much more well-liked by people. Uh, and, and so it's not that we reject densification, it's that we have to figure out how to produce it. So an image just to, to provoke you there. Um, I will end there um, because I'm sure there are comments and questions galore. Um, and uh, I will say that, um, uh, again, I want to uh, tip my hat to the funding agencies that I, um, uh, that I mentioned on the cover slide. Um, I will say that um, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now, which is around crowdsourcing popular perceptions of density, uh, is thanks to a partnership grant that I have uh, from Shirk with 10 colleagues across Canada, and it's called the Balanced Supply of Housing Node. It's co-funded by the Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation. We've got about $1.4 million for about five years. And, uh, and then I also have two other major projects, one based in Sweden and one based in uh, Belgium on uh, uh, densification uh, and, uh, and, uh, and strategies and tactics for transdisciplinary co-production. So stay tuned. I, I look forward to somehow sharing um, uh, with, uh, with the world um, some exciting and enticing uh, results. And of course, there's plenty of good work that's being done by others on how we can make densification work socially and culturally. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Luca, for that fascinating and thought-provoking presentation. And I'm gonna turn to the chat to um, read some of the questions that have come in. So the first one I see is, how do we reduce nimbyism and other barriers to densification? Yeah. So, so this is a really, really, uh, it, it, one could say it's the six, okay, this is gonna be a dated reference, the $64,000 question. How do we reduce nimbyism? Well, the first thing we have to do to reduce nimbyism is to recognize that, that these, are, these are genuine concerns that are being expressed. Uh, and then to talk to people about what is it that they're concerned about. And so I think to reduce it, uh, one, there's a bit of give and take that has to be uh, done on, 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 uh, on all sides. Um, one of them is that, NIMBYism is usually uh, a, a very pointed critique of something that people are skeptical about. Uh, and it's often NIMBYism in the sense of um, the state is telling us that we want to do this. The city government wants to build this, or they're allowing a developer to build that. Um, there's a concern there. There's a grain of truth, or there's a grain of something that we cannot avoid. Um, how do we reduce it? 
the basic um, tactics, the suite of tactics that, that, that I'm exploring with my research team now is that, as I said at the beginning, perceived density is what people are worried about. And absolute measures of density are have not been shown to be uh, consistently problematic. Um, and so reducing nimbyism uh, where densification is going to take place or should take place uh, is, is a matter of understanding what it is that people are worried about and afraid of and ensuring that we don't inflict that on people when uh, whether we're architects, builders, um, regulators, um, uh, political representatives, and so on and so forth. And so the give and take might also be that, you know, if the density target, the minimum density target that's been set by the provincial government in the Greenbelt or in the PMAD, uh, or in, in the zone agricole um, is so many, 250, 500 jobs and units per square kilometer per, per hectare, as the case may be, we might have to drop that target down. We might have to be more, be, be more malleable. So it's cultural work. It's, it's work of conversation and, 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 um, and deliberation and uh, recognizing and understanding people's concerns and not dismissing them and not saying, well, you're just, you're just being reactionary. You're just being closed-minded. Saying, yes, you have concern, it's legitimate. Let me, let's have a conversation about where the concern um, has, has broad, uh, is, is broadly shared and where it's something you might be afraid of because you associate um, what you see um, with bad outcomes or bad, uh, bad experiences in the past. Okay, great. So I think maybe the next question sort of leads into the answer you just gave. Um, one of our uh, listeners, one of our audience members, is asking, what are your prescriptions for densifying in a socially acceptable way? For example, can urban design help public consultation techniques, incentives such as added amenities? Yes, 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 and yes. I would edit the comments um, in a very particular way, which is to say public consultation is not what we need. It's actually public engagement. And I think one of the problems with NIMBY, one of the reasons we see NIMBYism is that we have developed in, in Anglo-American contexts by and large, uh, institutional practices of consultation. We're going to consult the public. If you've ever paid attention to a public consultation process as it plays out, the name is quite appropriate because it's like a private sector actor hiring a consultant and taking what is recommended under advisement. And that means a lot of the recommendations that are made by a body, such as the OCPM in Montreal, are ignored, are summatively ignored. So the work is actually public engagement. It's listening and, and, and moving to coherent actions. Doesn't mean that we can necessarily come up with solutions that are consensual, uh, where everyone is going to be happy, but uh, where we can actually uh, have some coherent actions. So yes, urban design helps, uh, but uh, so much of the work is, is having conversations about the benefits of density, but also in recognizing that densification has entailments. You cannot just increase densities and expect people to be happy. What we're seeing a lot of, Halifax is a great example of that, of this. Um, and some, some colleagues uh, at, uh, at Dalhousie have done some excellent um, empirical research on this. New housing is being built and no amenities and no services are being provided nearby. So what ends up happening is people have to get into their cars and drive long distances and the VMTs are still high. People are not riding their bikes and walking, even though that's what's being shown in all of the sort of the, the promotional images for why this densification is good. Right, great. Okay, we have a question. Um, are there examples of co-creation strategies where satisfying densification can be achieved through a collaborative design process? Yes, there are. Um, and uh, the, 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 the issue is that they're, they have not yet scaled up very well. The successful examples have been at very small scales where uh, 10 or 20 units are being built. Um, on a parcel of land that might be, uh, you know, half a hectare in size, okay, uh, or smaller. Um, but it's not, we don't see examples of this happening at the scale of something like uh, the Griffintown uh, district uh, in Montreal. And that's, of course, because having conversations and co-creation and co-production, the, the transaction costs are very, very, very high. It requires a lot of face time. It requires a lot of trust building. Uh, it entails maintaining trust. Um, it entails feedback loops so that, so mobilization in, 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 in public engagement, there are two kinds of challenges in mobilization. One is getting people involved at the beginning, so to speak, of a process. 
But the bigger challenge is actually keeping people involved and mobilized because people are quite willing often to come out. Monsieur Madame, quite willing to Le Mans. They're willing to come out to a, a public meeting when something's being announced. But then the attendance drops off especially as they see no tangible results. They see no evidence of how their voices are being heard. Um, they don't see modifications to what's being shown. And again, the public trust and cynicism that, that really came to a head in the 1960s and the 1970s, um, it's still fresh in the minds of people who, who, uh, who are around um, and who experience that directly. And, and we end up with this sort of a character of a situation where it's just the government wants to do this and they're just going to ram it down our throats. It's going to be Vietnam and Place de la Cité all over again. And and then, you know, you get people who are not listening, not listening, not listening, not listening. So are there examples? Um, yes. Um, where I, I find frustration and the reason I'm not saying have a look at this place at this, this address um, is that I don't know that there are examples um, in Montreal that go beyond the scale of a co-housing project where a bunch of households got together and collaborated on the production of, of, a, of a new uh, endeavor, a new project, a new, uh, new set of housing starts. But uh, if you want to do a bit of Googling and you want to see some interesting examples of soft densification, well, you can start with Googling soft densification, densification douce, um, and you can look up the cottagecompany.com, which, which is a private sector land developer doing soft densification in the Pacific Northwest of, uh, of the United States. And they've done some really interesting and successful stuff. Okay, great. Um, I have a question here about gentrification. So densification has a lot of nimbyism for single family homes wanting to protect the value of their properties. However, places where there's redevelopment and densification such as saint Henri, has had the effect of gentrifying the area and increasing the value of properties. What can be done to assure to mitigate the gentrification the gentrification effects of densification. Yes, I'm, I'm only laughing because I'm gonna say something that um, will make some people roll their eyes and, and that I think uh, very few people in, um, in, uh, in, in the sort of um, the existing power structures necessarily um, want to hear, um, which is that the affordability crisis in housing and the gentrification that happens when projects are undertaken, whether they're in good faith or whether they're cynical and they're very sort of, you know, making quick, a quick buck and so on and so forth. Gentrification happens with densification because we have uh, decided that, that private markets are the best way to allocate land and housing to people. Uh, and, and so a lot of the discussion around how are we going to take, um, do serious um, work on, um, on, on the affordability crisis in housing points to the fact that we have to de-commodify housing. We have to uh, make housing less of something that is an investment vehicle, uh, especially on, obviously for owner-occupied, but it's also true for rental housing, um, which is often an investment vehicle for whomever the owner is, uh, and make it and treat it again like a, like a service uh, to, and, and something uh, that uh, people have, have, have fundamental rights to. That's an old Marxian, Marxist statement, right, to say we have to decommodify land and decommodify housing. Um, but there is interesting work that's being done now. Sue Bunce at the University of Toronto has uh, done excellent work on community land trusts and uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, uh, which is the federal agency responsible for financing um, a lot of housing production, um, is also tremendously interested in this. And um, um, they're, uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to be working with them on a number of um, sort of uh, workshop groups. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're also the co-funders on the big partnership grant on balancing the supply of housing. So it's not an easy, there isn't an easy answer. Um, the other thing I might mention very quickly, and this is just a bit more planning jargon for you, is community benefit agreements, which is uh, it's a legal tool that has been very successful in the United States. If, an, if, an, if a transformation is going to take place on a specific site, then what should also be done is that an, a, a, a legally binding contract should be set up, which is to say that amenities and other positive contributions have to be made to the context as part of the transformation. And that doesn't mean that the private sector developer is the one who's on the hook, so to speak, because private sector developers work with very tight margins in many cases in terms of their profits, um, but that uh, the state actually steps up and provides uh, you know, the sorts of amenity services uh, and uh, and the accessibility to those uh, amenities and services that uh, that everyone deserves. Okay, great. So we have a couple more minutes, and since you sure. alluded to Toronto and private developers, um, mm -hmm. I think I, I would like to squeeze this question in. 
Sure. So how can one persuade developers in cities such as Toronto to change their approach to consider a better quality in development and densification, considering that only financial explanations persuade the developers and even the city authorities? For instance, any examples of financially successful projects that could integrate humanistic approach to their design? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but one of the things we have to do is to to sort of um, uh, change the way that land is valued. Um, change, work on some of the aspects of of of, of how property, real property, um, and that's 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 sort of a legal and philosophical and political question. But um, you know, that's that's sort of a, a longer term transformation. And again, that's why the idea of a community land trust, which is to say that the land is not something that's necessarily uh, the the commodity, but it's the it's the usability of the land. Hamburg. The city of Hamburg in Germany has done very successful stuff um, in terms of transforming the way that housing is produced. And it, it means legal entailments in the building contracts, uh, which is uh, to say that the state will have to provide certain kinds of support, tax relief, uh, subsidies, uh, and so on and so forth. Another thing that we haven't yet done much uh, in Canada on, but which has had various kinds of success, I'm not going to say it's been tremendously successful across the board, is what's called the transfer of development rights. Um, which is to say that if you own um, a piece of land uh, and it would be in your financial interest as the owner to densify and, and build out and create architectural space on that entire piece of land, um, you're probably going to do that. But if you can sell off the rights to that airspace above, your, above whatever exists, whether it's just no architecture, no building, or a one or two story building, you will still realize the financial gain, right? And transfer of development rights is a system whereby people can literally take those unbuilt stories uh, above uh, a parcel of land and put them onto another parcel of land where it might be easier or less uh, problematic, um, so to speak, to, to increase densities. Um, but my first, I guess the fundamental thing I would say about how do we convince developers, it's kind of like the NIMBY, the response to the NIMBY question, right? We have to talk to people, we have to talk to these actors because they have legitimate concerns and they're doing the best they know, right? I go back to Voltaire on this. Um, they're doing the best they know and sometimes we can all learn a little bit more. So if it's the we who's saying, let's densify, let's do this, let's decommodify, we need to do some learning about how that's possible, so. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this concludes our time today. I would like to thank our speaker again for taking his time to present with us. It's a very thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure we, we all learned something and we'll, be, we'll have something to think about going forward. And I want to thank Thais um, and my team for helping to organize the seminar. Thank you for all of those who participated and for all your questions and have a great day, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you so much for your attendance and your questions. Thought-provoking. Very good.